I was informed that today is President's Day. So, uh, you know, it's a holiday. <laughs> so, uh, I like sometimes to relate the holidays to the Dharma. So there was an article in the New York Times in ta uh, entitled George Washington Slave Catcher. So we all know, you know, on President's Day, that Abraham Lincoln did not start out the Civil War as an abolitionist. We all know that Je uh, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner and uh, had a family with one of his slaves. And now George Washington is busted as well. <laughs> so no matter what he did with that ter cherry tree, you know, it, whatever you do, it catches up with you at some time or another. Okay. So I thought I'd kind of read it. When he was 11 years old, Washington inherited 10 slaves from his father's estate. He continued to acquire slaves, some through the death of family members and others through direct pur purchase. Washington's catch of, of cash of enslaved people peaked in 1759 when he married the wealthy widow, Martha Dandridge, Kutis, his new wife, brought more than 80 slaves to the estate at Mount Vernon. What, what state is Mount Vernon in? Virginia. Virginia. Okay. So on the eve of the American Revolution, where he's fighting, fighting for liberty and freedom and democracy for everybody, uh, nearly 150 people were counted as part of the property at Mount Vernon. In 1789, Washington became the first president of the United States, a planter president who used and sanctioned black slavery. Washington needed slave labor to maintain his wealth, his lifestyle, and his reputation. As he aged, Washington flirted with attempts to extricate himself from the murder, murderous institution, uh, but he never did. So the reason I picked this up, it's like us who we have a fault or a bad habit or a strong affliction and we always think, you know, I really should do something about that. But we never do. Okay, so that's, that's why I'm bringing this up. During the president's two terms in office, the Washingtons relocated first to New York and then to Philadelphia. Although slavery had steadily declined in the North, the Washingtons decided that they could not live without it, like we cannot live without our bad habits. Once settled in Philadelphia, Washington encountered his first roadblock to slave ownership in the region, Pennsylvania's gradual abolition Abolition Act of 1780, which was from before he became president. The act began dismantling slavery, eventually releasing people from bondage after their 28th birthdays. Under the law, any slave who entered Pennsylvania with an owner and lived in the state for longer than six months would automatically be set free. This presented a problem for the new president. So, like all presidents in American history, they know how to work the system. Washington developed a canny strategy that would protect his property and allow him to avoid sc public scrutiny. Every six months, the president's slaves would travel back to Mount Vern Vernon or would journey with Mrs. Washington outside the boundaries of the state. In essence, the Washingtons reset the clock, i.e., okay, it's kind of like the immigration debate now. You go back to your own country for a while and then come back. I mean, you, you work the system. Okay, the president was secretive when writing to his personal secretary, Tobias Lear, in 1791. 
I request that these sentiments and this advice may be known to none but yourself and Mrs. Washington. Okay, so that's like us. You know, we have our bad habits. We work the system in the sense that we know how to make it look like we don't have those habits, you know, or we do negative deeds, but again, you know, you take the slaves out of the state, you work the system. So we put on a front, and then nobody suspects that, we're, that you know, when we're alone, we're really doing what we're doing, and, you know, who knows what in the world we're doing, that we're trying to extricate ourselves from, but we just can't bear to, to do it. Okay, you have some habits or behaviors like that, anybody? Okay, uh, you know, let's be honest about it. So the president went on to support policies that would protect slave owners who had invested money in black lives. In 1793, Washington signed the first fugitive slave law, which allowed fugitives to be seized in any state, tried, and returned to their owners. Anyone who harbored or assisted a fugitive faced a $500 penalty, which must have been like an extraordinary amount of money then, and possible imprisonment. So having power, he did things that, reinf you know, he hung around with people who believed like he believed, who also couldn't bear to stop certain behaviors. Yeah. And so, you know, to please those people, to please himself, he... He did that. Okay, so Washington almost made it through his two terms in office without a major incident involving his slave ownership. On a spring evening in May 1796, though, Ona Judge, the Washington's 22-year-old slave woman, slipped away from the president's house in Philadelphia. At 15, she had joined the Washingtons on their tour of Northern Living. She was among a small cohort of nine slaves who lived with the president and his family in Philadelphia. Judge was Martha Washington's first attendant. She took care of Mrs. Washington's personal needs. And she bolted. What prompted Judge's decision to bolt was Martha Washington's plan to give Judge away as a wedding gift to her granddaughter. Judge fled Philadelphia for Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a city with 360 free black people and virtually no slaves. Is that near where you're from? Good for you. Within a few months of her arrival, Judge married Jack Staines, a free black sailor with whom she had three children. Judge and her offspring were vulnerable to slave catchers. They lived as free people, but legally belonged to Martha Washington. Washington and his agents pursued Judge for three years dispatching friends, officials, and relatives to find and recapture her. Twelve weeks before his death, Washington was still actively pursuing her, but with the help of close allies, Judge managed to elude his slave-catching grasp. George Washington died on December 14, 1799. At the time of his death, 318 enslaved people lived at Mount Vernon, and fewer than half of them belonged to the former president. I think the rest belonged to his wife. Okay, but still, that's a good over 150 people. Yeah. Washington's will called for the emancipation of his slaves following the death of his wife. Okay, but at least he emancipated them. He completed in death what he had been unwilling to do while living, an act made easier because he had no biological children expecting an inheritance. 
Martha Washington lived until 1802, and upon her death, all of her human property went to her inheritors. She emancipated no one. Okay, so the reason I'm telling this story, there's still a little bit more, is he had the thought, oh, I should, you know, emancipate these people and give up slave owning, but it was so it was so comfortable to have slaves, and so you'd done it for so long, and everybody, you know, all his friends did it, and, you know, he could, like, work the system so he didn't get caught, and the people he didn't want to know about it didn't have to know about it, and he could keep them enslaved all the time in Pennsylvania. But, you know, he, he knew he was going to die, and he thought, okay, at least when I die, I'll, I'll give it up. Yeah, of course, he had no choice then, but at least he, you know, liberated his slaves at that point. So that's like us who, you know, we have our bad habits that we kind of keep like this, and we have our excuses for them, and, uh, you know, hang around people who, who won't ask too many questions, and even if they learned, wouldn't make a big deal, you know. And we always have this, you know, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, opposed to this bad habit, um, but, you know, Unfortunately, at death, we can't will them out of existence. They, they continue on with our mind stream at the time of death, okay? But wa Mother Martha Washington, she was like, <coughs> you know, and couldn't even give them up at death time. Yeah, kind of amazing. Or if you want to do it another way, you know, some of us may have things, you know, that we could use to create merit by being generous. And we say, um, later, later, I'll do it later, ma, 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 and we never do. And then at death, you know, we, we leave it in our will. Um, you know, Martha Washington, maybe she wanted to take it, everything with her. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe they burn paper money for her. <laughs> like they do in Singapore. When asked by a reporter if she had regrets about leaving the Washingtons, the judge responded, no, I am free and I have, I trust, been made a child of God by the means. Ona Judge died on February 25th, 1848. She has earned a salute during the month of, Fe of February. So, I mean, that's an interesting story, but the reason I brought it up is because there's an analogy with, you know, our mind and, and our faults as well that I thought was, was kind of interesting to, you know, kind of shine some light on. Yeah. So not that we can w rid ourselves of everything instantly, but I think the moral of the story is at least start on the process. Yeah, and, and not do the, sh you know, the shenanigans to uh, try and cover it up. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, how difficult it was for Washington to not only battle what was going on inside and change it, but also, you know, the people around, you know, at least in Virginia and South, supported what he was doing. And... Uh, <coughs> and so, similarly for us, you know, if we hang around people who, who support our, uh, our bad behavior, then we'll continue with it. And so your point was how important it is to be around the people that we want to become like. Yeah. And to practice together with people. <laughs>